over an absinthe bottle by W.C. Moreau. Arthur Kimberlin, a young man of very high spirit, found himself a total stranger in San Francisco one rainy evening at a time when his heart was breaking, for his hunger was of that most poignant kind in which physical suffering is forced to the highest point without impairment of the mental functions. There remained in his possession not a thing that he might have pawned for a morsel to eat, and even as it was, he had stripped his body of all articles of clothing except those which a remaining sense of decency compelled him to retain. Hence it was that the cold assailed him and conspired with hunger to complete his misery. Having been brought into the world and reared a gentleman, he lacked the courage to beg and the skill to steal. Had not an extraordinary thing occurred to him, he either would have drowned himself in the bay within twenty-four hours or died of pneumonia in the street. He had been seventy hours without food, and his mental desperation had driven him far in its race with his physical needs to consume the strength within him, so that now, pale, weak, and tottering, he took what comfort he could find in the savoury odours which came steaming up from the basement kitchens of the restaurants in Market Street, caring more to gain them than to avoid the rain. His teeth chattered. He shambled, stooped, and gasped, he was too desperate to curse his fate. He could only long for food. He could not reason. He could not understand that ten thousand hands might gladly have fed him. He could think only of the hunger which consumed him, and of food that could give him warmth and happiness. When he had arrived at Mason Street, he saw a restaurant a little way up that thoroughfare, and for that he headed, crossing the street diagonally. He stopped before the window, and ogled the steaks, thick and lined with fat, big oysters lying on ice, slices of ham as large as his hat, whole roasted chickens, brown and juicy. He ground his teeth, groaned, and staggered on. A few steps beyond was a drinking saloon, which had a private door at one side, with the words, family entrance, painted thereon. In the recess of the door, which was closed, stood a mare. In spite of his agony, Kimblin saw something in this man's face that appalled and fascinated him. Night was on, and the light in the vicinity was dim, but it was apparent that the stranger had an appearance of whose character he himself must have been ignorant. Perhaps it was the unspeakable anguish of it that struck through Kimberlin's sympathies. The young man came to an uncertain halt and stared at the stranger. At first he was unseen, but the stranger looked straight out into the street with singular fixity, and the death-like pallor of his face added a weirdness to the immobility of his gaze. Then he took notice of the young man. Ah, he said, slowly, and with peculiar distinctness, the rain has caught you too without overcoat or umbrella. Stand in this doorway. There is room for two. The voice was not unkind, though it had an alarming hardness. It was the first word that had been addressed to the sufferer since hunger had seized him, and to be spoken to at all, and have his comfort regarded in the slightest way, gave him cheer. He entered the embrasure, and stood beside the stranger who at once relapsed into his fixed gaze at nothing across the street. But presently the stranger stirred himself again. It may rain a long time, he said. I am cold, and I observe that you tremble. Let us step inside and get a drink. He opened the door, and Kimberlin followed, hope beginning to lay a warm hand upon his heart pale stranger led the way into one of the little private booths with which the place was furnished. Before sitting down, he put his hand into his pocket and drew forth a roll of bank bills. You are younger than I, he said. Won't you go to the bar and buy a bottle of absinthe and bring a pitcher of water and some glasses? I don't like the waiters to come around. 
here's a twenty dollar bill. And Kimberly took the bill and started down through the corridor towards the bar. He clutched the money tightly in his palm. It felt warm and comfortable and sent a delicious tingling through his arm. How many glorious hot meals did that bill represent? He clutched it tighter and hesitated. He thought he smelled a broiled steak with fat little mushrooms and melted butter in the steaming dish. He stopped and looked back toward the door of the booth. He saw that the stranger had closed it. He could pass it, slip out the door and buy something to eat. He turned and started. The coward in him, there are other names for this, tripped his resolution. So he went straight to the bar and made the purchase. This was so unusual that the man who served him looked sharply at him. Ain't gonna drink all of that, are you? He asked. I, I have friends in the box, replied Kimberly. And we want to drink quietly and without interruption. We're in number seven. Oh, beg pardon. That's all right, said the man. Kimberlin's step was very much stronger and steadier as he returned with the liquor. He opened the door of the booth. A stranger sat at the side of the little table, staring at the opposite wall just as he had stared across the street. He wore a wide-brimmed slouch hat, drawn well down. It was only after Kimberlin had set the bottle, pitcher and glasses on the table and seated himself opposite the stranger and within his range of vision that the pale man noticed him. Oh, you have brought it. How kind of you. No. Please lock the door. Kimberlin had slipped the change into his pocket and was in the act of bringing it out when the stranger said, Keep the change. You will need it, for I am going to get it back in a way that may interest you. Let us first drink, and then I will explain. The pale man mixed two drinks of absinthe and water, and the two drank. Kimberlin, unsophisticated, had never tasted the liquor before. He found it harsh and defensive, but no sooner had it reached his stomach than it began to warm him and sent the most delicious thrill through his frame. It will do us good, said the stranger. Presently we shall have more. Meanwhile, you know how to throw dice. Kimblin weakly confessed that he did not. I thought not. Well, Please go to the bar and bring a dice box. I would ring for it, but I don't want the waiters to be coming in. Kimberlin fetched the box, again locked the door, and the game began. It was not one of the simple old games, but had complications in which judgment as well as chance played a part. After a game or two without stakes, the stranger said, You now seem to understand it. Very well, I will show you that you do not. We will now throw for a dollar a game, and in that way I shall win the money that you received in change. Otherwise I should be robbing you, and I imagine you cannot afford to lose. I mean no offense. I am a plain spoken man, but I believe in honesty before politeness. I merely want a little diversion. You are so kind-hearted that I am sure you will not object. On the contrary, replied Kimberlin, I shall enjoy it. Very well, but let us have another drink before we start. I believe I am growing colder. They drank again, and this time the starving man took his liquor with relish. At least it was something in his stomach and it warmed and delighted him. The stake was a dollar aside. Kimberlin won. The pale stranger smiled grimly and opened another game. Again Kimberlin won. Then the stranger pushed back his hat and fixed that still gaze upon his opponent, smiling yet. With this full view of the pale stranger's face, Kimberlin was more appalled than ever. He had begun to acquire a certain self-possession and ease, and his marvelling at the singular character of the adventurer had begun to weaken. 
when this new incident threw him back into confusion. It was the extraordinary expression of the stranger's face that alarmed him. Never upon the face of a living being had he seen a pallor so deathlike and chilling. The face was more than pale. It was white. Kimberlin's observing faculty had been sharpened by the absent, and after having detected the stranger in an absent-minded effort two or three times to stroke a beard which had no existence, he reflected that some of the whiteness of the face might be due to the recent removal of a full beard. Besides the pallor, there were deep and sharp lines upon the face, which the electric light brought out very distinctly. With the exception of the steady glance of the eyes and an occasional hard smile that seemed out of place upon such a face, the expression was that of a stone inartistically cut. The eyes were black, but of heavy expression. The lower lip was purple. The hands were fine, white and thin and dark veins bulged out of them. The stranger pulled down his hat. You are lucky, he said. Suppose we try another drink. There is nothing like absinthe to sharpen one's wits. I see that you and I are going to have a delightful game. After the drink, the game proceeded. Gimblin won from the very first, rarely losing a game. He became greatly excited. His eyes shone. Colour came to his cheeks. The stranger, having exhausted the roll of bills which he first produced, drew forth another, much larger, and of higher denominations. There were several thousand dollars in the roll. At Kimberlin's right were his winnings, something like two hundred dollars. The stakes were raised, and the game went rapidly on. Another drink was taken. Then Fortune turned the stranger's way, and he won easily. It went back to Kimblin, for he was now playing with all the judgment and skill he could command. Once only did it occur to him to wonder what he should do with the money if he should quit winner. But a sense of honour decided him that it would belong to the stranger. By this time the absinthe had so sharpened Kimblin's faculties that the temporary satisfaction which it had brought to his hunger having passed, his physical suffering returned with increased aggressiveness. Could he not order a supper with his earnings? No, that was out of the question, and the stranger said nothing about eating. Kimblin continued to play, while the manifestations of hunger took the form of sharp pains, which darted through him viciously, causing him to writhe and grind his teeth. The stranger paid no attention, for he was now wholly absorbed in the game. He seemed puzzled and disconcerted. He played with great care, studying each throw minutely. No conversation passed between them now. They drank occasionally. The dice continued to rattle. The money kept piling up at Kimberlin's hand. The pale man began to behave strangely. At times he would start and throw back his head as though he were listening. For a moment his eyes would sharpen and flash and then sink into heaviness again. More than once, Kimbling, who had now begun to suspect that his antagonist was some kind of monster, saw a frightfully ghastly expression sweep over his face, and his features would become fixed for a very short time in a peculiar grimace. It was noticeable, however, that he was steadily sinking deeper and deeper into a condition of apathy. Occasionally, he would raise his eyes to Kimberlin's face after the young man had made an astonishingly lucky throw, and keep them fixed there with a steadiness that made the young man quail. The stranger produced another roll of bills when the second was gone, and this had a value many times as great as the others together. The stakes were raised to a thousand dollars a game, and still Kimberlin won. At last the time came when the stranger braced himself for a final effort. With speech somewhat thick, but very deliberate and quiet, he said, You have won $74,000, which is exactly the amount I have remaining. We have been playing for several hours. I am tired, and I suppose you are. Let us finish the game. 
Each will now stake his all and throw a final game for it. Without hesitation, Kimberlin agreed. The bills made a considerable pile on the table. Kimberlin threw, and the box held but one combination that could possibly beat him. This combination might be thrown once in ten thousand times. The starving man's heart beat violently as the stranger picked up the box with exasperating deliberation. It was a long time before he threw. He made his combinations, and ended by defeating his opponent. He sat, looking at the dice a long time, and then he slowly leaned back in his chair, settled himself comfortably, raised his eyes to Kimberlin's, and fixed that unearthly stare upon him. He said not a word. His face contained not a trace of emotion or intelligence. He simply looked. One cannot keep one's eyes open very long without winking, but the stranger did. He sat so motionless that Kimberlin began to be tortured. I will go now, he said to the stranger, said that when he had not a scent and was starving. The stranger made no reply, but did not relax his gaze. And under the gaze the young man shrank back in his own chair, terrified. He became aware that two men were cautiously talking in an adjoining booth. As there was now a deathly silence in his own, he listened. And this is what he heard. Yes, he was seen to turn into this street about three hours ago. And he had shaved. He must have done so, and to remove a full beard would naturally make a great change in a man. But it may not have been he. True enough, but his extreme pallor attracted attention. You know that he has been troubled with heart disease lately, and it has affected him seriously. Yes, but his old skill remains. Why, this is the most daring bank robbery we ever had here. A hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars, think of it. How long has it been since he was let out of Joliet? Eight years. In that time he has grown a beard and lived by dice throwing with men who thought they could detect him if he should swindle him. But that is impossible. No human being can come winner out of a game with him. He is evidently not here. Let us look farther. Then the two men clinked glasses and passed out. The dice players. The pale one and the starving one sat gazing at each other with $148,000 piled up between them. The winner made no move to take in the money. He merely sat and stared at Kimberlin, wholly unmoved by the conversation in the adjoining room. His imperturbability was amazing, his absolute stillness terrifying. Kimberlin began to shake with an ague cold, steady gaze of the stranger sent ice into his marrow, unable to bear longer this unwavering look. Kimberlin moved to one side, and then he was amazed to discover that the eyes of the pale man, instead of following him, remained fixed upon the spot where he had sat, or rather, upon the wall behind it. A great dread beset the young man. He feared to make the slightest sound, Voices of men in the barroom were audible, and the sufferer imagined that he heard others whispering and tiptoeing in the passage outside his booth. He poured out some absinthe, watching his strange companion all the while, and drank alone, and unnoticed. He took a heavy drink, and it had a peculiar effect upon him. He felt his heart bounding with alarming force and rapidity, and breathing was difficult. Still his hunger remained, and that in the absinthe gave him an idea that the gastric acids were destroying him by digesting his stomach. He leaned forward and whispered to the stranger, but was given no attention. One of the man's hands lay upon the table. Kimblin placed his upon it, and then drew back in terror. The hand was as cold as a stone. The money must not lie there exposed. Kimberlin arranged it into neat parcels, 
looking furtively every moment at his immovable companion, and in mortal fear that he would stir. Then he sat back and waited. A deadly fascination impelled him to move back into his former position, so as to bring his face directly before the gaze of the stranger, and so the two sat and stared at each other. Kimblin felt his breath coming heavier and his heartbeats growing weaker. But these conditions gave him comfort by reducing his anxiety and softening the pangs of hunger. He was growing more and more comfortable and yawned. If he had dared, he might have gone to sleep. Suddenly, a fierce light flooded his vision and sent him with a bound to his feet. Had he been struck upon the head or stabbed to the heart? Oh, he was sound and alive. The pale stranger still sat there staring at nothing and immovable. But Kimberlin was no longer afraid of him. On the contrary, an extraordinary buoyancy of spirit and elasticity of body made him feel reckless and daring. His former timidity and scruples vanished and he felt equal to any adventure. Without hesitation, he gathered up money and bestowed it in his several pockets. I am a fool to starve, said he to himself, with all this money ready to my hand. As cautiously as a thief, he unlocked the door, stepped out, reclosed it, and boldly and with head erect, stalked out upon the street. Much to his astonishment, he found the city in the bustle of the early evening, yet the sky was clear. It was evident to him that he had not been in the saloon as long as he had supposed. He walked along the street with the utmost unconcern of the dangers that beset him, and laughed softly but gleefully. What would he not eat now? Ah, would he not? Why, he could buy a dozen restaurants. Not only that, but he would hunt the city up and down for hungry men, and feed them with the fattest steaks, the juiciest roasts, and the biggest oysters that the town could supply. As for himself, he must eat first. After that, he would set up a great establishment for feeding other hungry mortals without charge. Yes, he would eat first. If he pleased, he would eat till he should burst. In what single place could he find sufficient to satisfy his hunger? Could he live sufficiently long to have an ox killed and roasted whole for his supper? Besides an ox, he would order two dozen broiled chickens, fifty dozen oysters, a dozen crabs, ten dozen eggs, ten hams, eight young pigs, twenty wild ducks, fifteen fish of four different kinds, eight salads, four dozen bottles each of claret, burgundy, and champagne, for pastry, eight plum puddings, and for dessert, bushels of nuts, ices, and confections. It would require time to prepare such a meal, and if he could only live until it could be made ready, it would be infinitely better than to spoil his appetite with a dozen or two meals of ordinary size. He thought he could live that long, for he felt amazingly strong and bright. Never in his life before had he walked with so great ease and lightness. His feet hardly touched the ground. He ran and leaped. It did him good to tantalize his hunger for that would make his relish of the feast all the keener. Oh, but how they would stare when he would give his order, and how comically they would hang back, and how amazed they would be when he would throw a few thousand dollars on the counter and tell them to take their money out of it, and keep the change. Really, it was worthwhile to be so hungry as that, for then eating became an unspeakable luxury, and one must not be in too great a hurry to eat when one is so hungry that, is beastly. How much of the joy of living do rich people miss from eating before they are hungry, before they have gone three days and nights without food? And how manly is it, and how great self-control it shows, to dally with starvation when one has a dazzling fortune in one's pocket, and every restaurant has an open door? To be hungry without money, that is to spare. To be starving with a bursting pocket, that is sublime. Surely, the only true heaven is that in which one famishes in the presence of abundant food, which he might have for the taking, and then a gorged stomach and a long sleep.
The starving wretch, speculating thus, still kept from food. He felt himself growing in stature, and the people whom he met became pygmies. The streets widened. The stars became suns and dimmed the electric lights, and the most intoxicating odours and the sweetest music filled the air. Shouting, laughing, and singing, Kimberlin joined in a great chorus that swept over the city. And then... The two detectives who had traced the famous bank robber to the saloon in Mason Street, where Kimberlin had encountered the stranger of the pallid face, left the saloon. But unable to pursue the trail farther, had finally returned. They found the door of booth number seven locked. After rapping and calling and receiving no answer, they burst open the door. And there they saw two men, one of middle age and the other very young, sitting perfectly still and in the strangest manner imaginable, staring at each other across the table. Between them was a great pile of money, arranged neatly in parcels. Near at hand was an empty absinthe bottle, a water pitcher, glasses, and a dice box, with the dice lying before the elder man as he had thrown them last. One of the detectives covered the elder man with a revolver and commanded, Throw up your hands! But the dice thrower paid no attention. The detectives exchanged startled glances. They looked closer into the face of the two men. And then they discovered that both were dead. Today's story was Over an Absinthe Bottle by W.C. Moreau. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, sweet dreams.